Well, hello, everybody. It's great to be in Pennsylvania. It's great to be here with you. Uh, I've spent the last two years basically talking about Bill and Hillary Clinton. I wrote a book called Clinton Cash, and I'm just thankful. Well, thank you. I'm just thankful to say that that is now a subject of history rather than current events. But let me talk to you about an event that occurred during the Obama administration that very few people actually noticed. In 2013, something historical happened that has enormous consequences in the United States. You see, in 2013, Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, the seat of our government, became the city in America with the highest per capita income in the United States. They surpassed Silicon Valley, they surpassed New York, you name it. So today in the United States, the wealthiest city per capita in income is the seat of our government. Seven of the 10 wealthiest counties in the United States are counties that border our nation's capital. The finest wines are consumed in Washington, D.C. at a greater rate than anywhere else in the United States, including Napa Valley. And just to show you how bad cronyism and corruption has become in our nation's capital, the amount of wealth circulating there is tremendous. A couple years ago, I did a segment, a one-hour special for Fox News called Boomtown. You can find it on YouTube if you want to take a look at it. And there was this fascinating interview we conducted with a guy who worked for a car dealership, Ferrari of Washington, D.C. Yes, this is the Ferrari dealer in Washington, D.C. And we talked to him about how business was. And he said, oh, business is great. We're selling lots of cars, lots of cars in Washington, D.C. But we're in trouble with Ferrari of North America, our parent company. And I said, well, why could that be? How could it be if you're selling so many cars? And he said, well, let me tell you something. There's a Ferrari dealership in Beverly Hills. And there's a Ferrari dealership in South Beach in Florida. And in those cases, people come in and buy Ferraris, and they finance their purchases. And Ferrari of North America likes that when they finance their purchases. The problem we're running into is when people come to Ferrari of Washington, they pay cash. So that tells you the state of what we face today. I want to talk to you about three things today that I think are vitally important. First of all, I'm going to suggest to you a new way to think about what's going on in Washington, D.C. Second of all, I'm going to give you some examples of the rampant crony corruption that I think explains why reforms never seem to occur and why things seem to get worse. And then finally, I'm going to propose some basic solutions that overwhelmingly, if you survey people, Republicans, Democrats, Democrats, independents, liberals, and conservatives all seem to agree about 80% are a good idea, but alas, the reforms never seem to take place because of the permanent political class in Washington. Now, what do I mean about a new way of thinking about politics in Washington, D.C.? I've been tracking politics for 30 years, and generally, most of the news coverage and most of the analysis of politics is done on ideological terms. This is what conservatives believe, this is what liberals believe. And I'm a conservative, so I identify with a conservative viewpoint. The problem is, I have come to the conclusion that much of what goes on in our nation's capital has less to do with ideology and philosophy and has more to do with a business model. What do I mean by a business model? Well, there was a Chicago Ward politician who was once asked, how do you define politics? And he said, politics is the art of putting people under obligation to you. <laughs> Think about that for a second. Politics is the art of putting people under obligation to you. That is a business model of politics. And what does that mean? It means essentially that Politicians are looking for opportunity to create a demand for their services. They want to be relevant. Think about this for a second. If you are a politician, and by no means all of them fit that category, let me be clear about that. But if you are a politician, many of them look at an opportunity, whether it is tax policy, whether it is environmental policy, and they look for opportunities to insert themselves in the process. Why? So they can extract donations, they can extract lobbying contracts for their friends and family, or they can extract opportunities for themselves when they leave public office. 
This is a school of thought in economics called public choice theory. And essentially what public choice theory says is think about people in government and politics the way, same way you think about people at corporations or in private business. They are looking for opportunities, by and large, to maximize their own self-interest. They are looking for opportunities to create wealth for themselves and for their family members. And so what this means, I would argue, is you have to look at what happens in Washington, D.C. below the surface. If there is debate over tax policy or health care reform, don't just look at it from the standpoint of the left and the right, limited government or bigger government. Look at it from the standpoint, who's getting paid how? And the example that I would give to you to think about this is professional wrestling. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I grew up in Seattle, Washington, and I still remember the day when I was about 12 years old, I turned on Channel 13, and I saw something that lit up my eyes as a 13-year-old boy, and that was large, muscular men throwing people out of the ring, hitting each other with chairs. I experienced professional wrestling for the first time, and I hate to break it to maybe some people in the audience, uh, but I quickly realized it wasn't real. These guys don't hate each other. These guys, you know, when they're smashing each other with chairs or they're throwing each other out of the ring, they don't hate each other. The secret is they're actually business partners. They're working together in concert. And I would contend to you that there are huge philosophical differences in Washington, D.C., but lots of times what you see in Washington has less to do with two people hitting each other with chairs and throwing each other outside of the ring and has more to do with the business partnership model. So, you know, what do I mean by that? Well, let me give you a couple of examples. Have you ever wondered why laws and bills in the United States are so complex now? You know, there was a reform of the entire financial system in the 1930s under FDR, um, and, and that entire bill was 36 pages long. They took 36 pages to revamp the entire financial system. The next time that that was done was in 2010, a piece of legislation called Dodd-Frank. You're probably familiar with it. Dodd-Frank was not 36 pages long. It was not 360 pages long. It was not 3,600 pages long. When you count all the rules, it was about 10,000 pages long. Now, has the banking system become more complex than it was in the 1930s? Yeah, sure. But that much more complex? The problem is not just the size of the bill. The, the problem is it's impossible to decipher and to understand. Warren Buffett, the best lawyers on Wall Street, said, we don't understand what these rules mean. They, they, they make no sense to us. And the problem was there are very serious implications. If you don't follow the laws in Dodd-Frank and you're in the financial sector, you could end up in jail. So you look at a bill like that and you can say, why and how did this happen? Well, one possibility is that this is just an example of liberals and progressives run amok. Uh, and that certainly was a factor. But remember what we talked about. Think about the business model here for a minute. Think about the business model. Who stands to gain by complexity and difficulty in trying to interpret laws? And the answer, the answer you can find by what happened after Dodd-Frank was passed. Now Dodd-Frank, of course, was written by the staff of Senator Chris Dodd and Congressman Barney Frank. That's why it was called Dodd-Frank. After Dodd-Frank became law, the congressional staffers who wrote that monstrosity resigned from Capitol Hill and they opened up a consulting firm to advise wealthy financial institutions on how to comply with the law. $100,000 to walk in the door for a first consultation. You see how that works? I mean, this would be the equivalent of taking a bill like this and writing it in an ancient language like Sanskrit, and then you have to hire a translator of ancient languages to tell you what's in the bill. 
And that is not just something that's related to Dodd-Frank. This goes to environmental reg regulations, other banking regulations, you name it. The point being that we do not have increased complexity in our legislation simply because progressives have run amok. We have complexity built into our laws because it's a way for the political class to extract donations from the rest of us. So complexity is one of the problems we have and one of the reasons that we have this sort of get-rich-quick approach that so many of the political class engage in. But let me give you another example. The recent health care reform bill. You all have, I'm sure, strong opinions about it. I was not in favor of this bill. I think if you're going to get rid of uh, the uh, Obamacare, uh, you need to do it and not do it in half measure. But let's think for a second. Why, what would be the motive for doing a series of half reforms? One of those certainly is, you know, maybe you're trying to build consensus, you're trying to bring more people on board, but let's think about this for a second. Healthcare represents 20% of the entire U.S. economy. And any time Congress reforms a large sector of the economy like this, what happens? The, the companies affected, in this case health industry, hires lots of lobbyists, makes lots of campaign contributions, pays a lot of attention to the political class. So if you are going to reform health care and you have this kind of extractive model, the last thing you want to do is have one large act of reform that solves the problem. Because once you solve the problem, you have less opportunity to extract money from powerful corporations. Let me give you another example. You ever heard of something called tax extenders? Tax extenders are these things that are written into the tax code, which uh, are, are designed to provide tax breaks for industries. And to give you one example, starting in 1981, Congress created something called the R&D tax credit. For certain companies, if you engage in research and development, you actually get a tax credit. Now, it's been on the books since 1981, but it's never been made permanent. Every two years or so, it needs to be renewed by Congress. Have you ever thought why they do that? Have you ever wondered why they do that? Why don't they just simply make it permanent? It'd be a lot easier for companies to plan ahead knowing that the R&D tax credit was going to be there, and it's been there for more than 30 years. Well, remember our extractive model again. If you make it permanent, you can't go back to the companies that need it and extract more donations, more lobbying contracts for family and friends. So instead, update it every two years. You can go to them with hat in hand and you can get the benefit that you want from them. That's how the system works. So my point is basically this. We need to start looking at Washington, D.C. from the standpoint of how they are extracting wealth and recognize that there is a business model in operation. This is why Right now, even though we have a Republican Congress, a Republican Senate, and a Republican White House, you are not going to see radical reform in a lot of these areas unless the political class feels the heat, because they don't have the financial incentive to do so. All of their incentives are tied up with the status quo and perpetuating the kind of system that currently exists. Well, what do we do about it? Do we just gripe? Do we just sort of accept this and, and, and uh, you know, move forward? Something tells me the people in this room don't just sit on their hands and do nothing. So let me recommend a couple of things that I think we need to push, that we need to encourage, and that are going to be vitally important if we're going to see reform take place in our nation's capital. The first thing is we need to have zero tolerance for corruption and cronyism, whether it's Republican, Democrat, or independent. Look, for far too long, both political parties and people that have engaged in politically corrupt activities, if they get caught, would essentially tell their constituents, yeah, okay, he did that, but he's better than these guys, and you agree with them on the issues, so, you know, just let it slide. Here's the problem with that. The problem is once you let it slide, it's only going to get worse. And here's the thing. If we are conservatives who believe in limited government, we ought to have a very simple principle. 
No one is irreplaceable. No one is irreplaceable. What makes the conservative movement great is the fact that we have ideas that matter, ideas that are transformative. It's not one individual or two individuals or a powerful senator or a congressman or political leader that makes the conservative movement what it is. And so if individuals are engaging in self-enrichment, we need to call them out and we need to insist that they stop. That means a zero tolerance policy when it comes to these sorts of issues. Second of all, we need to apply the family rule. Now, I am a big believer in family values. I'm a big believer that the family is important, but when it comes to the political class, we need to not allow them to use their political position to extract wealth for themselves and their family members. Right now in the United States Senate, by some estimates, one out of three sitting senators has an immediate family member, an immediate family member, that's a husband or wife or immediate child who is a registered lobbyist. And what they want to convince you is that these people are being hired not because of their, ex not because of their last name, but because of their expertise. In other words, these individuals are being picked because they're just very smart and that's why they're being picked as lobbyists, which is just hogwash, which is just hogwash. Lobbying is all about access and the best way to get access in the United States government is to hire the family member of a powerful political figure and then things are going to happen for you. We need to not only hold into account the political figures themselves, but their family members. And if they are engaging in self-enrichment, that needs to stop. So I would encourage and I would support to drain the swamp. We need to not only have a ban, a lifetime ban on lobbying by members of Congress once they leave office. We need to have a ban on immediate family members being able to lobby, period. Let's talk about a, a, a second issue, and that is money in politics. Money in politics is an issue that gets discussed a lot. Uh, primarily, the view that people have about money politics is what I call the Jimmy Stewart syndrome. You all watch that movie, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington with Jimmy Stewart. In that film, it sort of personifies this idealistic guy who goes into the Senate, and these outside nefarious forces just start to chip away at him, and they're trying to corrupt him. This is what I call the bribery model of money in politics, and it goes basically something like this. Idealistic, wonderful political figures go to our nation's capital intending to do good, and these outside interests just sort of chip away, and they tempt them, and eventually they just succumb, and they're bribed, and they are corrupted. Well, that certainly, I guess, can happen, but I will tell you the experience of most people in Washington, D.C. is opposite. The scenario is not one of bribery, the, one, the scenario is one of extortion. Politicians look for opportunities to extract money from powerful businesses or powerful interests. That can come in the form of campaign contributions, that can come in the form of lobbying contracts for families and friends, or that can come in the form of contributions to things like leadership PAC. There was a, a survey done of business, exec, business executives a few years ago which asked them if they ever felt as if they had to make a political contribution to prevent something bad from happening to them. Uh, and overwhelmingly, the business executives said yes, they had done that on a regular basis. In my book, Extortion, I interviewed a guy who had served as the CEO of, of uh, the Shell Corporation, and he described a congressional hearing that he went to in 2009. You might remember in 2009, gas prices were, were sky high, uh, and so in this particular case, he was being lambasted by members of Congress for extorting money from consumers by charging too much for gasoline. And in fact, at that hearing, a congresswoman, and he gave me the name, so I'll give it to you, Maxine Waters, said, Said, you know what? Maxine Waters told him, you know what? We may have to nationalize the Shell Oil Corporation. After the hearing, this is that, that part is on video. What happened after that hearing may surprise you. According to the CEO of the Shell Corporation, Maxine Waters came to him afterwards and said, you know what? I might understand your perspective better if you organized a fundraiser for me. 
So you see how that works? That's the extortion model. I can make problems go away or I can stop, you know, banging the drum on certain issues for you if you essentially will give me money. This happens frequently in Washington, D.C. Uh, and needs to stop. They even have a name for it. Anybody here ever heard of a milker bill? A milker bill? Milker bill has nothing to do with the dairy industry, by the way. A milker bill is designed to do one thing, milk contributions from powerful entities. And here's the point. You don't actually want your milker bill to pass because if it passes, you can't bring it up again next year and extract more money. So all of this is a roundabout way of saying we need to rethink the issue of money in politics and we need to change the way in which we are trying to break the back of this problem. So here is what I suggest. We need to start regulating politicians rather than people when it comes to money in politics. And what do I mean by that? Well, in 29 states, including the state of Florida where I live, there's a very simple rule or law. And that is when the state legislature in Florida is in session, and in 28 other states, when it's in session, you cannot solicit or receive campaign contributions, period. Period. You see how that works? The regulation, the restriction is on the politician, not on outside entities. Now, just imagine for a minute if we did this in Washington, D.C., what might happen. First thing I'll tell you is we'll have pretty short congressional sessions, right? <laughs> but more to the point, it, it, it eliminates one of the tools that the political class often uses to extract wealth, and that is the fear that Congress is going to do something to hurt your business. I've had people in the energy industry tell me all the time that when the energy co committee is meeting and legislation is being introduced that's going to affect them, they get regular calls from political figures asking for donations and they feel compelled to give. Why? Because they're essentially being extorted. They're being asked for protection money. If you had this kind of reform, that would not happen. Now, I'm not saying this solves everything, but I think it's an important step to move in this direction of reform. So let me just close by saying this. We need to be optimistic. The American people in November concluded that Washington, D.C. was corrupt and needed a change. If you look at the surveys, the exit surveys from the polling, the number one issue that emerged from those exit polls was not immigration, it was not tax reform, it was not terrorism, it was corruption. Three out of four Americans believe there is widespread corruption in our nation's capital, and I think the other quarter just aren't paying attention. So, this is a time for us to be optimistic. This is a time for us to push for reform. And this is us for time to hold the political class in account in a manner, in a way in which they have never been held into account before. And that is going to start with the people in this room. You are all extremely well informed. You are all concerned and conscientious about what's going on in the country. It has to start with you. So I want to encourage you to hold our political figures into account, write them, tell them that these sorts of issues are important to you, and together we can have a transformative effect on the way things are done in Washington. With that, I'll say thank you very much. Thank you.